So on this slide, we want to talk about cohomology groups HI, which vanish for I greater than zero for affine varieties. So we already know H zero is the global section. The question is what are cohomology groups H1, H2, H3 and so on. So here the theorem says for a affine variety, all these H1, H2, H3 are zero. So you start by saying X is an affine variety. You obviously have a ring of global sections on it. Call it O of X. Fix a module M and M is a OX module. And then you can define a quasi coherent sheaf F on it by M tilde. Yeah, this we have defined before. Now you fix a open cover of a fine variety X. Yeah, this cover is U and this I is a finite set. I is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on to M. So these are all standard affine sets and our claim is for all i greater than zero, this h i is zero. So for the proof, we will follow, Dan follow Daniel Perrin's work uh, from page 118. So we assume first is that O of X is a integral domain. M is torsion free. Uh, these two facts will be important later on to clear denominators and make certain assumptions. So the torsion free helps us in the sense that if F belongs to O of X and M belongs to M, FM equals to zero implies either F is zero or M is zero. So for the proof, we first start with the case I equals to one. So first of all, we need to define these open covers. So say u of i is equal to u of fi, where fi is the element of the global section. Now let us recall how u of fi look like. You fix the, fix the space x. Now you have a polynomial fi, which I, I'm drawing in rust color. It cuts the affine variety x in say four places then u of fi is nothing but the set x minus those four points where the polynomial fi equals to zero vanishes. Yeah, so the polynomial is fi equals to zero which has been drawn in rust color. So we start by saying that let alpha ig be a co-cycle. Co-cycle means it lies in the kernel of a map in the complex. So since we are going to talk about H1, we want to talk about kernel of map D2. So this is D1, this is D2 here. D2 takes C1 to C2. So let, let us remind ourselves that H1 is kernel of D2 over image of D1 elements of kernel of D2 are called co-cycles and image elements are called co-boundaries. So in the end we will have to prove that alpha ij is a co-boundary to and that will give us h1 as 0. So you know when we define check complex we have to arrange indices in increasing order. So this will help us in mapping C1 to C2. So we have the following co-cycle relation. 
so we have to go from c1 to c2 and we are going to talk about kernel of d2 so let us remind ourselves how c1 looks like so c1 look like this f u i j and c2 looks like this that f u i j is u i j is nothing but u i intersection u j and then c2 looks like f of u i j k so if you are still confused about it stop here go to check cohomology slide and look at the circle example so this is how the elements are of c1 so alpha i hat j k is actually alpha j k i is missing then alpha i j hat k is j missing so these are all elements of the complex one yeah so j k lies in set u j k now i is at index zero so following check cohomology you write minus one raised to the power of zero j k then j is at index one and then k is at index 2 so this is 0 so this is getting mapped in the complex 2 so, so this is kernel in c2 so this is till now we are just following the definition so basically this is what we get directly from the definition of check cohomology and how the maps operate obviously we have to remember the ordering is i j and k i is less than j j is less than k now if we want to forget about ordering we will just have to add something extra here we will just say alpha i i is 0 and alpha i j is equal to minus alpha j i Yeah, if we no longer want to arrange them every time in increasing order now obviously alpha i j is actually a part of f of u i j which is nothing but m tilde u i j and how do elements of m tilde u i j look like they look like beta i j over f i n times f j n yeah where beta i j belongs to m so again this is just by definition of m tilde so you have u i j so obviously u i j means u f i times u f j or u underscore f i times f j so we can use the same n for all of the finite cover yeah because there are only finite number of open sets which cover it so you can just use the same n now we rewrite star as the following so we are just copying the formula or the expression we wrote for alpha ij Yeah, so we are re rewriting this expression yeah so again you see this last expression this is nothing but alpha ij so we have the first expression is alpha jk minus alpha ik minus alpha ij now we are just going to rearrange this and rearrangement will be possible because m is torsion free so you take alpha ij out on one side multiply throughout by fk superscript n and this is what you will get yeah again this is possible to do because m is torsion free now we still have to show that alpha ij is a co-boundary and that will give us h1 is 0 So we have to show that alpha ij lies in the image of t1 only then h1 would be 0 
So the question is, what does image of D1 look like? Now D1 is a map from C0 to C1. So this is how it will look like. C0 is f of ui and C1 is f of uij which is f of ui intersection uj. So we have elements in C0 are of the form gamma i, gamma j. Yeah, because they belong to sets like f of ui. And we have to show that some combination of gamma i, gamma j, you know, when t1 acts on it, it makes it alpha ij. So the most important relation we are going to use is that open sets ufi are equal to open sets ufi n. Since ufi cover x, u of fi n also cover space x. So covering the space x means that the they will cover this ring O of x and covering any ring means being able to generate the unity element of that ring. So if you are able to generate the unity element, you can just multiply by any element of the ring on the left hand side and you get it, get its generators on the right hand side. So this is the important part. 1 is equal to summa of k equals to 0 to m that is the index of the open covers. So this is important. This is the key to the proof. And you need to set gamma j as something like this. So gamma j belongs to m tilde u of j. Yeah, because it has to lie in the set f u of j. And you can see this right hand side minus sama a k b j k over f j n. This lies or is a part of m tilde u of j because it has denominator as f j n. Yeah, you see the denominator f j n. So it lies in m tilde u of j. So gamma j setting it equal to like this with the denominator f j n makes sense. Now again we have to map this to C1. So we have to write gamma i as gamma i j hat. Yeah, so j is missing which is at index 1. And you write gamma j as gamma i hat j. i hat means i is missing. Again i is at position 0. So you have to write minus 1 raised to the power of 0. So the mapping is gamma j minus gamma i. So now we just plug in, first we plug in the value of gamma j and then we plug in the value of gamma i. So minus minus becomes plus, a k remains the same. So you have instead of j, you're just writing i. And that is pretty much it. Now you take this minus Yeah, you just take sigma a k out and then you can say from the expression in uh, double star that uh, this first part is just one from the red part and yeah, uh, it's pretty much clear. Now alpha i j is part of image of d1 because you, it is gamma j minus gamma 1. Now we want to talk about these cohomology groups which are greater than 1. So we have already shown h1 is 0 and we want to adopt the same procedure. So precisely we will copy what we did for h1. So first you define alpha i0 all the way to ii. So the numerator beta i0 all the way to ii is nothing but a part of the module and the denominator indicates that this lies in the this sheaf m tilde u i 0 all the way to i i. Yeah, this you can see because the denominator has polynomials f subscript i 0 superscript n 
then f i subscript 1 superscript n and so on again you have the partition partition of unity this precisely follows from the previous slide k is equal to 0 to m that is the cover of the set a fine algebraic set x again this partition of unity follows from this argument u f subscript i is equal to u subscript f subscript i n yeah and then you have to define these gammas these gammas have one index less because they get mapped to alpha so they lie in c i yeah and yeah so you just put beta k and uh, i 0 to i i minus 1 again the denominator is still index is still i minus 1 because this is part of the sheaf u subscript i subscript 0 all the way to i subscript i minus 1 because we are going from a lower index complex to a higher index complex a lower index complex has lesser intersections so just like this uh, sheaf here again we have to talk about gamma i hat and so on notice that all these indices are i minus 1 indices yeah because i 0 hat is not essentially in there and then you do again permute multiply with minus 1 raised to the power of index of the part which is missing add them up and uh, you will get alpha precisely like it was in case i equals to 1 now we can rewrite this result and you can say x is a a fine algebraic variety and you have this this exact sequence of quasi coherent sheaves on it and this will yield an exact sequence of global sections yeah so why will it yield an exact sequence of global sections so from this sequence of sheaves you can form a long exact sequence so you will have the global sections first and then you have h1 h2 h3 and so on but all those h1 h2 and h3 associated with fg and h are zero so this is how the sequence would start and then we come to another row where we write h1 then we come to third row which we write h2 but all those are zero by the theorem